This is the Merdeka Tower, the second tallest building in the world. But did you know that there are just as massive structures underneath the ocean? From skyscraper-sized oil platforms to subsea railway tunnels, megaprojects underwater are some of the most ambitious construction projects in history. Today, we'll uncover the insane size of these projects and explain how they were built. Let's take a look at the 500-meter-tall Bullwinkle oil platform that was transported to the middle of the ocean, and how steel piles taller than skyscrapers helped Bangladesh's Padma Bridge overcome the challenges of a raging river. So let's start with the insane size of oil rigs. The world uses more than 100 million barrels of oil every day. This means that oil companies are constantly looking for new oil reserves to meet the rising demand. More than two-thirds of the world's oil and gas is preserved under the ocean floor, and to extract these resources, giant offshore drilling platforms are being built. Early offshore platforms were built towards the end of the 19th century and drilled in areas where the water was less than 100 meters deep. Oil companies have invested heavily in the technology ever since, and oil rigs have become taller and taller and are comparable to some of the tallest skyscrapers on land. Back in 1997, Shell completed the first truly massive oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico. Nicknamed Prospect Cognac, the platform was taller than the Empire State Building and was built at a cost of more than $100 million. Since Prospect Cognac, taller platforms have become more commonplace, and today, we have four oil platforms that exceed the 500-meter height barrier. The oldest of these is Shell's Bullwinkle platform, which was installed in 1988. At 529 meters tall, it is almost as tall as New York's One World Trade Center. At the turn of the century, Chevron built the 640-meter-tall Petronius-compliant tower, which still holds the record today. At the time, it was the tallest structure in the world, but has since been surpassed by Dubai's Burj Khalifa, and more recently, by Malaysia's 679-meter-tall Merdeka Tower. But it doesn't stop there. Floating oil platforms nowadays reach up to 2,900 meters deep into the water. But how do you build such massive platforms underwater? The construction of an oil rig is completed in fabrication yards on land, from where it is transported to the middle of the ocean. For example, Bullwinkle's 400-meter-long base, or jacket, was built in Texas while lying on its side. To move the colossal structure to its final location, it was loaded onto a barge built in parallel with the jacket. Traffic on the Gulf Intracoastal Highway had to be diverted to safely load the platform onto the barge, a process that took five days. On top of that, it took three days to reach its final destination directly above an oil well. It was the largest structure ever moved at the time. Once directly above the oil well, Bullwinkle was submerged in the water by tipping the barge 2.5 degrees. The engineers then anchored the platform to the seabed using remote controls and underwater cameras. Bullwinkle's deck was constructed separately in Louisiana and fixed above the jacket. The entire project took over five years and cost over $500 million at the time. Since then, the record of being the largest structure ever moved could only be surpassed one single time by another offshore platform. It was the transport of the 460-meter-tall Troll A platform off the west coast of Norway. Bullwinkle remains the tallest offshore fixed platform. Most oil rigs like Bullwinkle are static and are used for drilling up to 500 meters deep into the ocean floor. However, oil and gas can also be found much deeper in the ocean. For depths between 500 to 1,000 meters, engineers may use compliant towers. Made with concrete and steel, compliant towers are tall and narrow structures, designed to endure greater forces as they can sway with the waves. The world's deepest oil wells, however, are located 13 kilometers beneath the ocean. Building steel towers and attaching them to the ocean floor at these depths is not practical, so engineers use floating oil rigs to make drilling possible. Using advanced positioning systems, these oil rigs stay exactly over the oil wells and are connected to the deep wells using anchors and kilometer-long cables. One such oil rig, Perdido, is jointly operated by Shell, Chevron, and BP. 
Perdido enables drilling at a depth of over two and a half kilometers through a 170 meter spar, a long floating cylinder that is submerged into the ocean and tied to the seabed using nine mooring lines. Constructed in Finland in 2008, Perdido remained the deepest oil rig in the world until Shell unveiled stones eight years later. With the ability to operate 2.9 kilometers beneath the seabed, stones can extract oil from reservoirs as deep as 8,000 meters in the ocean. The insane size of underwater megaprojects isn't limited to large oil platforms. Building kilometer-long underwater tunnels also poses enormous challenges. Attempts to construct the world's first underwater tunnel began in the early 19th century. At the time, they used the same techniques as in mines, but they failed because the ground was too soft and the tunnel started flooding. What was initially thought to be impossible, however, could be realized in the following decades with the help of new technologies. The 400-meter-long Thames Tunnel could be finished by 1843 by using the newly invented tunneling shield. Since then, subsea tunnels have only gotten better, and with the invention of the tunnel boring machine, projects were now possible at a much larger scale. Today, the tunnel with the longest underwater segment in the world is the 50-kilometer-long Channel Tunnel connecting Britain to France. Completed in 1994, it is considered one of the most amazing engineering feats of the 20th century. Plans to build a tunnel to cross the English Channel were being discussed way before the actual construction. Crossing the Channel by boat had always been a miserable task because of the bad weather and choppy waters. So once the technology became advanced enough, both the UK and France set about drilling a tunnel on their sides of the water. Before starting construction, experts examined the geology of the bottom of the English Channel and decided that the lower chalk layer, made up of chalk marl, was the easiest to bore through. The digging started in 1987 using 11 gigantic tunnel boring machines. Each machine was almost the length of two football pitches and weighed more than 70 passenger buses. Five machines started digging from France and six from the UK. They cut through the chalk, collected the debris, and transported it using conveyor belts. During the digging process, the sides of the tunnel were reinforced with concrete to help it withstand the intense pressure from the waves. The French and English sides of the tunnel finally met four years later, in May 1991. The whole project consisted of three parallel tunnels, two of which are reserved for trains, while the third one is used as a service tunnel. Construction costs for the Channel Tunnel rose to over $14 million, three times above the original estimates. However, the megaproject has been proven well worth the cost as more than $120 million worth of trade between the UK and the rest of Europe happens through the Channel Tunnel each year. While the Channel Tunnel has the longest underwater segment in the world, the longest subsea tunnel by overall length is the 54-kilometer-long Seikan Tunnel in Japan. The tunnel was built in the aftermath of an unfortunate accident in 1954, when the ferry ship Toyamaru sank in the Tsugaru Strait during a typhoon. Sadly, over 1,150 people died. Ferry rides were no longer safe, and engineers deemed bridge construction too risky because of the extreme weather conditions. The authorities ultimately decided to build a rail tunnel that would pass underneath the Tsugaru Strait. Construction began with a pilot tunnel in 1971. The excavation started on both sides and met in the middle around 12 years later. Another five years later, work on the main tunnel was completed by blasting through the seabed with explosives. The final cost of building the Seikan Tunnel was around $7 billion, and it remains one of the most spectacular engineering achievements to this day. If you enjoyed so far, make sure you like this video and subscribe to Top Luxury. Lastly, we look at underwater bridges. Unlike tunnels, bridges aren't often thought of as underwater structures. However, a major part of a bridge's pier can be located underwater. Piers for modern deep water crossings can be built using different methods. The most common techniques involve the use of caissons, cofferdams, or driven piles. Caissons are concrete structures constructed on land and then lowered into the water while preserving the dry environment inside. The workers keep on excavating sand and keep the water out until the caisson reaches the bedrock and is filled with concrete. 
Ultimately, the caisson becomes the foundation for construction above water. Cofferdams are large walled pits with water surrounding them. A cofferdam pumps the water out and creates a safe space construction. Once the foundation reaches above the water, the cofferdams are removed and construction continues as usual. One of the most effective underwater bridge construction methods is using the driven pile foundations. A driven pile is a large steel column that is driven into the rock using a machine. The whole process is similar to hammering a nail into a surface. Once in place, the steel columns are filled with concrete, providing a solid foundation for the bridge. Using the driven piles technique, Bangladesh recently completed construction of the longest bridge in the country with a length of 6.15 kilometers. But what's even more stunning is that the Padma Bridge is also the deepest in the world. The steel piles were driven at a record depth of 127 meters into the riverbed. Construction of the Padma Bridge posed further challenges because of the rapid water flow. It made piling extremely difficult, and the design for at least 14 of the bridge's pillars had to be changed several times over the years. Another consideration for the engineers was that the Padma Riverbed soil might shift up 65 meters in the next century. In total, the Padma Bridge cost $3.8 billion to build and is tipped to increase the country's annual GDP by 1.2%. Some of the economic benefits are already on display as the bridge has cut the distance between the capital, Dhaka, and the industrial hub of Kulna by more than 100 kilometers, and the travel time is reduced by more than 50%. Which of these was the most difficult to build? Do you know other construction projects in the ocean that we should cover? Let us know in the comments below. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.